Hello, oddlings. So we're going to start right here in the middle of the story with this amazing picture. So as you can see, fencing battle. Um, the guy with the top hat, that is the Prince of Wales, Britain's future King George IV, who's there in the audience to watch this showdown go down. As you can see, there's one lady with the rapier. Her name is Madame Blanchard. And it turns out that um, this is a battle that is the first thing that comes up when you search fencing in the 1700s. <laughs> and it was so popular that from the one drawing, many, many copies were made. Everybody had wanted to have a picture of this in their parlor. And one of the people who was in that battle was not a lady. She was a transvestite, exiled French spy. <laughs> and she's not who I'm talking about tonight. <laughs> so. Who could be more sexy and adventurous and amazing than that character, who definitely should earn an odd salon talk at another point? Our uh, fellow on the other side is Chevalier Saint-Georges, and we're going to start with his born name, Joseph Boulogne. Uh, he was born in the Americas. His dad got in a drunken duel with some more rapiers and murdered a man, and so instead of facing court, decided that was a great time to go back to France, where he was from. Okay, a few cocktails have been had, I understand. <laughs> so Joseph Ballone turns three at sea. He ends up in um, Bordeaux and grows up there, and his father manages through some like connections with the royal court to get a royal pardon from the king. Not only that, he also gets a position in the king's bed changer, bedchamber. So basically, because he's helping the king put on his underpants in the morning, the family is on the road for an aristocratic path, and so that means our man Joseph needs to go to a fancy pants school. So when Joseph Ballone turns 13, he's enrolled in Le Boissier's Academy of Fencing and Horsemanship, which is basically like a stepping stone path to being a fancy pants person in Paris at the time. <laughs> now, um, I'm pretty sure that this is what your class schedule looks like in the 1750s in France. Uh, the class schedule was pretty heavy on important things that you need to know if you're going to be part of the aristocracy. So in the morning, you study mathematics and history and foreign languages and music and drawing and dancing. The afternoon is reserved for the most important subject, yeah. fencing. Yeah. And this isn't like when your drama teacher or your ballet instructor said this is the most important thing. It really was a, a very... Um, crucial step to becoming part of the aristocracy because in France in the 1700s, people who were not empowered didn't get pointy things. So <laughs> if you wanted to be part of the power structure, you needed to have the skills of fencing, and um, that was why the school was named as such. You also learned horsemanship, which they did in the Tuileries, because this was a fancy pants schools, guys. And Joseph Ballone enters at 13. By 15, he's already kicking so much ass that he's beating his teachers in fencing duels. In, at 17, he's described as having the greatest speed imaginable, slicing and stabbing with a cool Zorro-style rapier and beating ass pretty much every time. Uh, so much so that um, well, so much so that <laughs> um, that he becomes known in a time when sword fighting is still your primary weapon for being pretty much the best of any 17-year-old that's ever been. It's kind of like being the starting striker in Real Madrid and... When he's not fencing and learning to dance and doing mathematics, he's got some hobbies. So according to the histories, he could often be swimming, seen swimming across the Seine with only one arm. In skating skills, he exceeded everybody else. As to the pistol, he rarely missed a target. In running, he was reputed to be one of the leading exponents in the whole of Europe. And in addition to his skills and his athlete, St. George was also an excellent dancer. <laughs> hobbies. But again, back to fencing, this was hell of important. He was hell of good. So back when he was 15, he was so well renowned for his fencing skills that a fencing master from a rival school starts throwing shade on Boulogne because he's heard all this stuff about how good he is and challenges this kid to a duel. 
So um, a whole bunch of people show up for this duel. Uh, the head fencing instructor loses the match to this 15-year-old and is so impressed that he puts Balone's picture on the wall of his fencing academy next to his swords. <laughs> next up, a guy named Gian Faldoni shows up from Italy and says, I want to fight this kid. It's a year later, so he's all of 16. And he's traveled across Europe to be able to meet this man in a duel. And Balone says, no, I'm busy swimming this in and <laughs> taking classes. No, thank you. And so what Faldoni does is basically become the Oprah of fencing. He's like, you get a duel, and you get a duel, and you get a duel. And um, fights pretty much every fencer in all of Paris until Valone decides that he can go ahead and have this battle. So all kinds of important fancy pants people show up. And it's a very close match. But Faldoni, the Italian, this time he wins. This is the only recorded defeat that Bologna ever has as an entire fencing career. And Faldoni is so impressed, he calls St. George the finest swordsman in Europe. He's not yet St. George, though. That doesn't come till he's 17, when he purchases a royal title, the officer of the cavalier, advisor to the king, controller, ordinary of wars. And I want to mention that there was a minimum age for this job of 25. <laughs> But a waiver was granted because Boulogne was so fucking good. Next up, he gets a job as the officer of the King's Guard. Now he's 18. He's Jamie Lannister of Paris. <laughs> and this really important job only requires three months of service a year, so he can keep going to school. So... <laughs> He's been in Fencing Academy for six years. At the age of 19, he's already called Le Chevalier, or basically he's been named a knight, even though there's kind of, it's questionable about whether or not that's really legal. People call him that anyway, so let's go for it. <laughs> At 19, he graduates, and now it's his coming out party. He's invited to the frothy upper classes of French society, dances in glittery ballrooms using all his dancing prowess. He converses in delicately appointed parlors, attend shows in opulent concert halls. He's rumored to frequent a number of ladies' boudoirs. <laughs> and let's be real, who could blame them? <laughs> He's handsome, athletic, well-connected, and of course, there's his music too, which I haven't mentioned. <laughs> but this is pretty accurate. So in an insanely awesome turn of events, all of a sudden, in 1764, when this kid is 19, he starts playing insane violin jams that blow everyone's faces off and <laughs> send them flying to the back of auditoriums around Paris. And before this point in time, nobody had any idea he could play. There's no record of him having any training ever played before. Apparently, he was too busy skating and shooting and running, and everybody knew about that. But this comes out of nowhere, and this guy fucking shreds. Not only that, but he also starts composing music. Um, if you know how to read music, you will know that all these little dots mean that's a lot of notes to fit into one page. <laughs> and this is the kind of shit that he writes. On top of that, he dresses in insane, cutting-edge, silver-trimmed courtier clothes, jams a bunch of badass songs that he extemporizes, playing his violin solos, and also was appreciated not as much for his composing as for his performances, enrapturing especially the feminine members of his audience. <laughs> okay, so he writes string quartets, concertos, sonatas, a bunch of other words that basically all mean badass classical jam, and then he bangs a bunch of croupies, and contemporary accounts speak of these romantic conquests. It made it into history. The young Chevalier becomes one of the darlings of fashionable society, and on more than one occasion, Queen Marie Antoinette herself was disguised as a regular noblewoman so she could go check out these shows, and later on in his career, he even played a string quartet with her. So, basically, this guy is a superstar in France. His performances in the sword, with the violin, with that other baton that he has. <laughs> When he's not serving in the Kingsguard, he's writing operas, managing concert halls, even commissioning new works from famous contemporary artists like Joseph Haydn. He's declared as having the best orchestra for symphonies in Paris and perhaps even Europe. 
by the musical almanac in 1775. And so it makes sense that he is, um, his name is put in for the most important prestigious musical post in France, which is the head of the Royal Opera for Louis the 16th. But this is prevented by some Parisian divas. I'm not throwing shade here. They literally sang in the opera. They were called divas. <laughs> And they petitioned the queen in writing against this appointment, insisting that it would be beneath their dignity and injurious to their professional reputation to sing on a stage under the direction of a mulatto. And that put an end to any aspirations saint Georges may have had in becoming musical director for that great institution. This was, as far as we know, the most serious setback yet he'd suffered because of his color. Oh yeah, that's right, I haven't mentioned that this man, Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges, was a mixed race man. He had brown skin and suffered all of the challenges that come with that. And every article that I read about this man started the article with that fact. But I didn't wanna do that to my story because I feel like it cheapens it a little. Like, he was black and he knew how to play the violin or he was pretty good at fencing for a black man. Um, I, don't, I don't like that approach. I feel like this man did so much, his accomplishments speak for themselves, and then they speak more so with the fact that he had to do that facing overt and systemic racism. Because his father, I know, right? So his father was living in the Americas in Guadalupe and his mother was a pretty 17 year old woman from Africa who was a slave at his plantation and gave birth to Joseph Ballone on Christmas day, 1745. So he was a son of a slave who showed up in Paris with a different color skin than everybody else and because of his African descent, he was basically forbidden by French law for participating in anything cool or exciting. His African heritage made him ineligible for nobility. All those titles that he was called by, that's not allowed to him. Racial attitudes made it impossible for him to marry anyone at his level of society. But this guy rarely seemed to give a shit about anyone else's <laughs> expectations of him and refused to let these motherfuckers step on him or talk shit because of his heritage. He just went ahead and did what he wanted to do and he was so fucking good at it that nobody could slow him down. And so this son of a slave remarkably um, makes it in French society through his mastery of all these different things in a period of time where slavery is legal in parts of the world. Nothing can really get in his way except for fucking history. Because even in his time, he's billed as Le Mozart Noir which is a little bit nicer than the black Mozart, but not by much. This man doesn't even get his own name sometimes when he's billed alongside of Mozart. And Mozart, at the period when St. George's musical career was at his peak, was still scouring Europe for steady work. They were um, contemporaries in a way, but St. George was the man who brought the idea of the violin quartet to Paris. He was really instrumental in, um, in his era in in his own work and didn't need Mozart to prop him up. Uh, he fights in the French Revolution. He runs an all black um, fighting force. He is falsely imprisoned for 18 months. He probably traveled back to Guadeloupe where there are palm fronts and uh, sees the slave rebellion that's going on there and makes it back to Paris in time for the end of his days dies at 53 and he's still famous there. So there's a bunch of um, commemorative editions of his work that appear in France. But after his death, Napoleon Bonaparte is in power. Slavery is um, reimposed and St. George and his music were removed from orchestra repertoires and especially from history books, not to be rediscovered for more than 200 years. There's only about a third of his compositions that have survived the last two, 100 years, but those that we have are certainly on par with the works of White Mozart and White Hayden, <laughs> White Chevalier St. George. All these other composers get their own names, so let's exit by giving this man his proper due and listening to some of his works with a matan. Yeah. Steam? <laughs>
about a homework project, ladies and gentlemen, because Le Chevalier St. George is not the only one who maybe has not gotten his due because of his talents for the fact that he may have a different color skin than um, the, the powers that be. So I encourage you to go home and check out his work, check out the work of somebody else. I feel like this man definitely deserves to be honored on this stage. And though he won many honors in his lifetime, I would like to award him a special honor here as the gentleman badass that he is. I feel like the order of the Wolpertinger should be a thing uh, that this man definitely is deserving of. And if you'd like to join our man on this honorable guild, just step up to the merch table over there, get yourself a medal. We've got some new pins for the new season. And um, it is one way to honor the incredible achievements of everybody who we've talked about on the stage tonight. So thank you for being here.